Hi, and welcome to She's the Boss, the show that is all about female founders and women doing extraordinary things in business. Uh, if you like the show, please will you subscribe to the channel, comment, all those sorts of things. But in the meantime, let me introduce my amazing next guest. Her name is Robin Foister. She's the director and founder of Foister Media, but a whole lot more than that. She's the owner and publisher of the carousel.com. Game Changers and WomenLoveTech.com. She's also the ex editor in chief and publisher of Australian Women's Weekly, Women's Day, and New Idea. And she's won numerous awards for both her editing and her entrepreneurial stuff. So welcome, Robin. It's fantastic to have you as my guest today. Oh, Jules, thank you so much for inviting me on. It's, um, I've been watching all of your shows and I think you're doing a great job. And it's wonderful um, to see someone out there supporting women in business. Thank you so much. What a lovely thing to say. I, this is all I want to gush about you. So <laughs> let, let's just start off by telling everybody what it is that you're doing right now. Oh, I'm juggling quite a few balls. Um, <laughs> uh, I've uh, I, I've got my own, obviously my my media business, and it's really a content production business as well. Um, uh, so you know, on GameChangers.com.au, um, I'm profiling people in business and our latest series. Um, we had uh, first um, Melissa Doyle and, and, and more recently Natasha Billing doing our TV profile interviews. That's um, amazing. So uh, let's just explain that a little bit more. So people can or women can come to you and say, I want to get a really amazing interview, and you put them in front of someone like Melissa Doyle and Natasha Belling, style them all up, get their makeup and making make them look gorgeous, and then they have this fantastic interview that they can then use to promote their business. Is that how it works. That, that's right. We're really um, telling their, their story behind their business um, and, you know, what they're doing. And uh, and actually we, we do, we were up to our, something about our 70th um, profile interview. Um, wow. Now, which is exciting. Uh, series going on to series 14. And it's done at Sydney Fox Studio. It's a three camera shoot. Um, it's like a TV show with a very specific TV format um, where we, um, we, you know, we get them flipping cards and talk about why they are game changers. Um, and that's been fun to do. Um, we have a little series from that as well. Um, what makes a game changer and what would you tell your younger self? And we do their photographs and, um, and we then help, you know, um, amplify that content across multiple sites. Oh, so you actually push it out as well. I didn't realise that. Yeah, yeah. It goes out on um, everywhere on, uh, on on a number of different people's websites, my own websites, on their channels. Um, we, we educate them about how you can amplify content to sit um, not just on the website. That's sort of old-fashioned. You know, you want it to be on YouTube. The videos can be uploaded onto LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. And you, know, you want multi-channels working um, uh, with it. Yes, I know that one very well. So tell me, though, a little bit now about Foister Media and the, the media that you're putting out as well. So um, then I have Women Love Tech, uh, which is really promoting women in STEM, also women in business. Um, and, you know, it um, has quite a younger, um, you know, the 20, 30-year-old women who are starting in business and, um, and they're interested in tech, they're involved in tech, but they also want to know what the latest is in apps and what's on what's streaming and uh and that's doing extremely well because i think that there's um you know a lot of people want to know what the latest technology is that can help their businesses or social media that's you know a fun outlet for them um so it's quite it's 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 quite i suppose it's like a, a um it's, it's quite mainstream in in many ways although because it's focused and targeted for women. Um, um, women and tech. I mean, it's just fantastic. It's amazing to me that there haven't been more titles out there like that, but yeah. I'm glad that you've put it out because we, you know, as women, it's not exclusively a male thing and we're trying to encourage all these girls to get into STEM that, you know, they want to be able to see the women that are out there doing it as well as sort of learning about the latest technology. So yeah. a brilliant idea. And then what about the carousel? And and um, the carousel um, is, is more focused on health and beauty and fashion and lifestyle. Um, and that's been going sort of for six years. Women Love Tech's actually been going longer. Um, it um, Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, it has, um, it, it is quite a niche site, but as you say, you know, it makes sort of um, tech fun and accessible. 
which is just wonderful. So here comes the big question before, although actually I'm going to ask you an even bigger question in a minute and get me to, get you to tell me about your career. But before we go there, what made you want to set up Foyster Media? What was it? Was there a light bulb moment where you just went, you know what, I'm going to go and start my own media empire? Yeah, uh, well, there was, and that was the fact that um, when I was in magazines, I, I I launched the websites of many of the magazines I worked for, um, and um, you know, with Women Love, um, with Australian Women's Weekly, um, I I revamped it, and it went from four to six million views a month. It was huge, you know, as well That's as the magazine. That's monstrous. Mm. Six million views a month. I didn't mm. realize it was so huge. I don't know if it is now, but there wasn't as much yep. competition in the market at that point. You know, we sort but of then on, in the same breath, I guess people weren't as used to going online to look in their me at their media in those days so that's right um, and yeah, also really it's amazing because bauer which for them became uh, more recently are you know allowed the editor um of the time to be personally involved in the uh, website now they have a different digital um operator operating the digital channels and the editors are op operating the sort of other um, that sounds a bit channels. weird. Is it, do you think? What do you think of that decision? That sounds strange to me. Like the the stories that you have online are different to the stories you'd have in a magazine, and yet it's really the same. I mean, you want the same great journalists to be writing those stories. Do you do you think that that's yes. a good well, not, thing that people involved, are splitting it up a bit? They're not not involved, and obviously I'm not there, so I'm not running it. But it was a strange move. Um, uh, back when, first of all, and actually when I was editor of Australian Women's Weekly, when 9MSM bought the digital titles or the rights of um, of what was then ACP, um, and and right. uh, and that, and it took them years to actually untangle that and then buy them back. So I don't think at that time when that happened, did they realise that that the digital was so valuable? Isn't that funny? They just thought, you know, it's a little small thing. We'll give it away to someone else and we'll concentrate on the print. And I bet they're regretting that now. Yeah. Well, I actually remember when they told all the editors that what they were doing. And I think a lot of people were very scared about losing their jobs at the time. And no one really spoke up. I did. I was the person in the room that was saying, you know, that, um, uh, that you know, I thought it was um, not the right move, um, but you know, the decision had been made really, and uh, it was you know the money that they got from nine MSN they thought was, you know, was worth Terrific. it. But but actually, as as time <laughs> to tell, um, they they had to get those those um, titles <laughs> back. Right. So was it that that prompted you? Was it sometime around there that you decided, no, I'm going to go out on my own and start digital media? Because it's a nice low barrier to entry in a lot of ways as well. Yeah, well, I was sort of like really interested. I, I really believe, because at that time I was publisher of um, of the Hearst titles, which is like Harper's Bazaar and Cosmo, and I looked after Woman's Day and various others. And I could see that that, you know, that if you wanted to, um, I didn't really want to be a dinosaur in my own world of, of media and you could see where it was going. It was going to digital, you know, it was really clear. Um, and, and we're talking seven years ago now um, when I left and set up my own entrepreneurial business. So it's sort of get moving on now. But back then, you know, the idea that video and short form content, I remember telling I won't name him, but, um, he, he, you know, a very senior executive a senior at person. Channel 7, <laughs> that I was moving into um, my own business and sorting and, 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 and working on a lot of short-form content, video content. And he said, I just don't buy it. He said, I don't see that that is really. <laughs> and I love that. I love that they're so short-sighted, which, <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess I've been talking a lot about how I think the media is broken and they still haven't really innovated in a way, the old the old mainstream media haven't really innovated in a way that no. is bringing in more income. They're just still trying to get ads in, and then you know it's just all really old fashioned. I think. Yeah, and I particularly look at breakfast television because I worked at Channel Seven on Sunrise, and you know there's so many different ways you can innovate on. on, <laughs> no, on and the they don't do shows. any of it, do they? It's the same old, same and the, old. And it really hasn't changed, and I'm surprised because I worked in breakfast television also in the UK. Yes, um, well let, let's. So let's go to that because the big breakfast was my absolute favorite i lived in london for about five years and on top of that i waited for it to come here because to me it was like 
hey, hey, it's Saturday, but just in the mornings. And it was such a clever idea that I thought they're bound to bring it here. And here we are 20 years later and they haven't done any change at all. Yeah, so while I was there when Chris Evans was the uh, host. Yes. And what had happened is that, you know, like I'd I'd ventured to the UK at some very – you know, young well, teacher. actually, no, no, let, let, let's go back and, and do this as a proper story. So you finished school and how did you end up in the UK? So I, I had finished school and I had um, got a job as a copy girl at News Limited to start with, um, as well as at the same time I was in my first year at university. And uh, then after... Had, had you always wanted to be a journalist? Was that sort of on your radar from a young age? I really always wanted to be a journalist, you know, um, to, you know, was very interested in in the history of and and of, of the, the property where I grew up and started writing stories. You know, living on a country farm, um, and <laughs> uh, and and knew always that I think it's really useful actually if you if, for, for youngsters if they actually have their their single minded about what they wanted to do because I never wanted to do anything else. So it became very. You're easy. very lucky. A lot. Of, I think a lot of youngsters just have no idea what they want to do. So I when know. you know from that early age, you're really lucky because you, you can, can just kind be of very follow that path. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so I, I ended up um, when I, I finished my degree, and then actually got a job as a graduate cadet at AAP. And while right. I was on holiday in the UK, I got a tour of uh, Wapping, and I hadn't planned to to stay there or anything, or get a job in Fleet Street or anything. Um, would have been sort of beyond what I thought were my means. And uh, and I, that's exactly what happened. I got a job uh, on... Well, hang on, let's just go back in because a lot of people won't know what Wapping was, but that was when Murdoch decided to bring a whole lot of print together or something, wasn't it? So, yeah, so so Wapping was basically... New, it was... Uh, the, the actual company was News International and it was, right. it was Murdoch's newspapers. Uh, and so he had a whole range of newspapers there. And uh, originally... Um, the paper that I was at was called Today Newspaper, which was the first ever colour newspaper. And I was first very lucky. ever colour newspaper. Doesn't that make us sound old? I remember it so well when it happened. It was so out there, the thought that you could buy a newspaper and there'd be colour on it. Yeah, it was quite big news <laughs> at the time. And and, um, and actually newspapers in general were big news because so that newspaper was, was launched by a man called Eddie Shah um, mm-hmm. and uh, he then sold it to Murdoch. And at that point... Um, you know, we moved, um, the, the journalist team uh, moved to Wapping um, and right. I survived various fallouts because in media, even back then, there were, I remember the night, of the, the, they called it the day of the long knives when I, I walked into the building and, and everyone said, oh, you know, have you got a job? And the person literally to the right, the person literally to the left were sacked. Um, or maybe God, you're it. lucky you survived it. There was a few survivals. I was thinking, how did I survive that? <laughs> um, but it was brutal, really brutal. Um, and <laughs> well, thank goodness you did. Yeah, lots of big drinking in the pubs afterwards and, you know, commiserating with those that didn't survive and then thinking to yourself, oh, thank God I made it, you know. Um, but, you know, they were just Yeah, I bet. And they were doing it all the time. And, okay. you know. So then I, 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 I landed on my feet and I got a job as I was only 23 years old. Um, and the first time I got a job, I remember the woman saying to me, who gave me the job, um, she'd been uh, Murdoch's right-hand woman. She said, oh, you know, you remind me of another young Australian woman who I once gave a job to. And I went, yeah, yeah, who's that? And she said, oh, Ita, her name was Ita Buttrose. <laughs> <laughs> and I like wrote home and I said, you're never going to get who I, you know, I got compared to. Little did I know that like years later, I would also be editor-in-chief of the Australian Women's Weekly. So... And I had um, great fun telling Ita that story many years later. I bet she absolutely loved it. So, yeah. okay, so you're in newspapers in England. How did you move into television? So I, I, I'd been in newspapers for um, quite some time, travelled the world, covered amazing stories everywhere, um, and then I moved to America um, uh, where I got a column on a news on, on today newspaper. We why, why America? Why did you go to America? I got asked by a journalist who had gone over there. <laughs> he asked nice. me to join him um, and and um, set up his little bureau with him, news bureau. And it was the time when there was so many stories happening out of Los Angeles. It was when you know the the charges against Michael Jackson came you know came out, and oh, uh, right. there was the Heidi Fleiss story. There was the earthquake that we went through. There was you know like. You know, there's a lot of news um, happening um, then, and it was 
you know, an exciting place to be. I remember one story that I covered was I didn't have the uh, pass to get to the Oscars. And I thought, you know, what, I've got my Scotland Yard pass. I'll just, I'll just turn up and I put my hair up in a nice big beehive and hailed a cab and said, can you take me to the Oscars? And they literally drove me there and there was like piles of people sort of like lined up everywhere. And I just kept asking for the media room and they just kept letting me in. And uh, sure. Oh, enough, you are so ballsy. Uh, I love it. <laughs> it's just, just one of those incredible times. So did that, you get in? Did you end up going to the Oscars that year? So what happened actually, so so I got right to the media room. They said, this is not, you know, I kept getting sent through to different areas and they said, that's not the right pass. You need a proper accreditation. Of course I knew that. I went, really? <laughs> and they said, yes, you can't come in, you know. And I went, okay. So I went down the stairs and then there was a door. And so quite boldly I opened the door and walked in and it was towards the end of the Oscars and I was actually backstage of the Oscars itself. Oh, my God, and at 23 with all those stars around. I was 23 and uh, and Harrison Ford was on stage giving the final um, award out. And I, I just had this thought, I could walk on stage now and say, hi, I'm Robin, I'm from Mudgee and I'm Australian and um, <laughs> hope you're enjoying your Oscars. <laughs> I didn't, but I could have. <laughs> that is so amazing. So um, from so from there, who, what was the what were you covering the Oscars for? Was that for the magazine still, or by then had you got into a bit of broadcasting and and what were you doing entertainment? I had start. This is sort of was the start of my sort of broadcasting career because I was there helping GMTV out and um, uh, and and actually what happened is that I I, I joined up with the GMTV team and uh, Thomas Keneally was there and I got him on on air and and Oscar Faffenberg who was the Jewish guy who had been the real hero of Schindler's List um oh, right. and uh which is the, that was the movie of the time and that was exciting um meeting him I thought all these celebrities here actually Oscar you are the biggest star you are the, yeah you've actually done something <laughs> yeah, to really help people. people in the holocaust you know <laughs> along with Schindler so um so yeah so I, I then ended up working for Big Breakfast and I was there their west coast American west coast report and I did all of their showbiz interviews. So so let's just talk a little bit about The Big Breakfast for anyone over here that doesn't know it. So that was owned by, I remember so well that it was owned by Bob Geldof's company. That was one of the big things. And Paula Yates did that, he used to do interviews on the bed, which, which is how she got together with Michael Hutchins. But what was it like in the early days? Because it was really like nothing we'd ever seen in Australia because they bought a house, didn't they, and then fitted out the house yeah, that's um, right. It was very, very different. Like it was fun, you know, um, uh, and and we used to do different things. So you, when I would go to interview the celebrities, you know, there was always all these other foreign journalists interviewing people. And as soon as I would say, I'm Robin Foyster, I'm from Big Breakfast, you know, the, the, the show that interviews people on the bed um, and they go, yes. <laughs> they all knew because I, I mean to this day no one else has ever done that as a format which no. is really kind of interesting in itself isn't it <laughs> and, so and so what were you doing you were doing live crosses to to every morning were you about what was going on in Hollywood I was doing I was actually I was doing not the live crosses I was just doing the celebrity interviews profiling them and 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 uh, what a and job that would have been my dream job did you love it it was fun. Um, it sort of went like this. Your day went like this. Your week went like this. On Friday, you know, like at the beginning of the week, you'd be say up told, or you need to do Tom Hanks, or you're going to interview whoever it was. Um, and it was always the major, major stars because of all of England, you know, um, the ones that they, the people they wanted to most look after was the um, was the breakfast with the people on TV covering it, and really big breakfast right. and GMT were the biggest. Um, right. So, you know, GMTV, we had 16 million views a week. Um, and I later Incredible. went to work um, for, for GMTV. But but Big Breakfast was fun. You know, I remember, um, you know, funnily enough, they, when I went, when I moved back from America, from America to England, um, Big Breakfast offered me a full time job and it was actually to be Paula Yates' um, producer. Oh, wow. And had I done that, I would have produced that actual segment that you were talking about earlier because that's yeah. when she met Michael Hutchins. And the controversy was that her husband owned the company and there <laughs> yes. she was on national television flirting with a man on, on the bed who later she ended up um, marrying. <laughs> it was just so extraordinary, wasn't it? Because the other thing was that she was so happy, well, happily married, but I mean, it was constantly in the media about her and her 
four perfect girls and this groovy lifestyle that they all led. And then suddenly, you know, she obviously was flirting with him and the next thing you know, it's all over and she's run off with him. Oh, you could see the chemistry. The chemistry was, you know, like it was just abundantly clear. Um, right. But I will tell you another funny story about Big Breakfast and it was um, with George Michael. And this is typical of what Big Breakfast would do that was, you know, fun and innovative. It's the sort of stuff, you know, you think about Breakfast TV, why are they doing this now? Um, but, but so George Michael um, and I was invited to this party with George Michael and he told me the story. Um, yeah. And it was basically that Big Breakfast turned up one day when he was ha had a very big night and, uh, and, and they thought, wouldn't it be fun? We've got nothing on television to do tomorrow. Let's turn <laughs> up outside George Michael's house and we'll have go-go girls and sing, you know, wake me up before you go-go. Um, that was the idea. Um, Great idea. And he had fallen asleep, he said, in front of the TV and he sort of opened his eye up and he said, oh, I've clearly had a really big night, he said, because um, that looks like my house and they look like go-go girls and you wake me up before you go-go. And then he sort of like looked again and he went, oh, my God, that is my house and they are outside my house. And anyway, they rang up and uh, they said to um, the producers at the time, Get out of his, get away from his house or you will never have George Michael again on your show, um, to which they sort of took off. But <laughs> That's amazing. It was such a great segment. show. The other thing I loved about it was Lily Savage. I don't know whether that was at the same time as Chris Evans, but for anyone who's watching, Lily Savage is, I would say, six foot four or something, a drag queen with a very deep voice who was absolutely hilarious with an accent from the north of England, yeah, she's rough great. as guts and gravelly voice, and she was just brilliant. And yet never again have I ever seen um, somebody like that hosting a show. No, exactly. They were just, they're just ahead of their time. And, you know, it's funny enough, when I went back to England, I didn't work for them. I had the choice. I worked for GMTV, which was much more, they weren't as um, young and funky, but they were much more mainstream, had a bigger audience. And uh, Right. That was much more like the Today Show and Sunrise that yeah. we have now, wasn't it? Just a, the talk show. And it's still going, that show, isn't it? Yeah, it's got a different name, but it's still going. It's the one with Piers um, uh, Morgan, who does the interviews oh. now. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but when I was there, it was Eamon Holmes and um, Fiona Phillips and uh, Lorraine Kelly is still on the same Well, that's show. right. Because, I mean, I, we could gossip, but Eamon ended up divorcing his wife and marrying another woman, and he and she have been hosting the show for about the last 15 years, I think, and they've just given the flick last week. Yeah. I was yeah. reading. Well, yeah, Eamon, so it's all... It was great, you know, like he's just a great guy and we we did a number of, I produced a number of, of different segments with him, like one with Tom Hanks and uh, he's just a lovely yeah, lovely guy. But, you know, yeah. we, we did do a lot more production um, behind, you know, when we produced things, like I, we had the Spice Girls um, uh, came to us to, actually came into the office and I had the the the, the, the plugger oh, wow. saying to me, yeah. this new musical act and um, they're, um, we, you've just got to see them to, you know, that'll make you really want to put them on the show. And because the thing is, if you went on GMTV, you, you virtually were certain to get number one because of the viewership. It was huge. So, right. um, and uh Anyway, so they came to the, the um, to my office, and <laughs> which was um, the Thames TV studio, and uh, and they started singing with a tape recorder. Would you be my lover? With a tape recorder, you know, they turned <laughs> oh, no. it on, and then they they're all sort of like dancing around, you know, would you be my. And so I was like, and they go, I'm Sporty Spice, and I'm Baby Spice, and I'm Fox Spice, and you know, they and people walking past me going, oh, you're. you're the entertainment desk is a bit, you know, like it all happens here, doesn't it? <laughs> and I swear Sporty Spice did a backflip as well. Like it was like, oh. Oh, my goodness, those so we girls. Put them on and they went straight to number one and then we never heard, we never stopped hearing from them actually, did we? No, and even now it's so funny because I thought of them as so lightweight and gimmicky and yet here they are now seen as kind of, you know, bastions of feminism and coming back it's it's quite a disconnect from the way that I remembered them. But anyway, we're getting caught up in all the gossip. So you worked at <laughs> um <laughs> you worked at the Big Breakfast when you got back. So you went and worked at GMTV. So what happened after that? Take me through your career because it's So yeah, so this is after newspapers and um uh TV then became, you know, like I was there for a while and then obviously had children and started um, then 
writing for um, all over, over the world as a freelance. So I used to do all the Hello covers, you know, with um, Tina Turner and Elmi. Hello Person. Magazine. Oh, my God, my favourite. Yeah, we had a lot of that. It was great. The great thing about, you know, it wasn't really about the words, as you know. It was all about the no. pictures. Um, it was all about getting the most incredible access. Um, so, you know, they sent me to cover to be- to Posh and Beck's house. It was called, um, they called Beckingham it Beckingham Palace. House. Beckingham Palace. <laughs> and it was up in Manchester and they had this big party. Um, and I think, you know, that they, they, um, they were raising money for the, um, a ch- children's charity and it was a white diamond um, party. So whatever you, you had to wear, a white um, and a diamond. And, uh, and I remember Mick Hucknall talking to him and he had a diamond in his tooth. <laughs> and he literally for this party he chiselled a diamond in his front tooth. Um, Amazing. I loved Simply Red, though, even though I, he doesn't come across as the, a particularly interesting guy, but... I liked the way he sang. So, um, okay, so you were covering these amazing things for Hello as well. Did you get to go to the Beck- Beckham's marriage with the with the thrones and the crowns and all the rest of it? You were, I was at their house. Like, I actually arrived too <laughs> early and David Beckham came out of his house in his boxer shorts. And I was like, <laughs> and he went, he went like this, do you want me like this? <laughs> I'm like, going, um, you, you're here for the party? And I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was sort of like... <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, um, so after that time, um, and and you got married presumably and had kids in was that in England and then came back yeah, to married, Australia. Had or? kids. Um, to be honest, most of my career uh, had been really in in the UK and in right. America, um, having you know a short career in Australia. Um, which is, you know, but I bet when you came back, they went, "Oh my goodness, you've been in London and America and Hollywood, and you know everyone. We want you to come and work for us." Yeah, effectively, effectively, that's what happened. They gave me a job as an editor, and I'd never edited a magazine in my life before. Wow, fact, what was I that magazine? Editing the magazine, I didn't actually know what a folio was. You know, like a, I didn't know so much. I didn't actually know what a JPEG was at the beginning. I didn't, you know, like the not, the lack of knowledge was appalling. Um, uh, what magazine was it that you started off on? So, so they gave me. Um, so what happened is that we we wanted to move to to New Zealand rather than Australia. To, so it was new for me and my husband. Um, right. And I got a job uh, um, as the editor of New Idea, um, and then they asked me to not just run New Idea, but to run all of the Pacific magazines uh, and run the the whole bureau for Pacific magazines uh, in in New Zealand. So, oh my god! Did you did you have a bit of imposter syndrome? Like, are they going to find totally. out, or were you just like, no, nope, I'm going to go for it? Totally, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but <laughs> I, but I, you know, like, funnily enough, um, you know, that I, I one thing I did know was that I didn't want it to be considered a trashy magazine because I had a really great background working on everywhere the Sunday Times and 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 various magazines all over the world and newspapers, and so it it was easy to 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 actually make an impression because you know we just got really solid stories and um and and uh and you know when there was the, my first week was the tsunami, so before I started the oh tsunami my God, two thousand and one oh that was just uh, such a terrible time, yeah, and I rang everyone and I said, "Are you going into the office because we've got a magazine to pull out now?" And no one was going in. I said, well, you are now, and so am I. So the first issue I actually edited and I actually wrote the cover story um, and I decided that I'd give 10% of the, the, the profits um, to Amnesty and various charities and, um, and you know, I, I just went and did stuff and asked questions later and <laughs> and got away with it <laughs> for a while. You are, but you're very lucky. Um, okay, so so you started off with those magazines. So, uh, so you were saying you wanted to go to New Zealand. Did you end up staying there for a while? No, because like two months in, and my and and they they said to me, we we need you in Australia. Um, so they flew me over, and uh, and said, right, um, we want to offer you the job here. Oh, how did you even go back to your husband and say, right, we're pulling the kids out of school, we're unrenting the house, we're going to go? Or well, that must have just been like such a uh, moment. Yeah, I said you've got to make it worth my while and my family as well because I've um, I've had you know the kids will have had three schools in six months, um, but the difference was you know I did make it they did make it worth my while um, and uh, and we we moved to Australia um, and again you know um, it was it, it it was interesting because they had 
um, it wasn't hard to to make an impression because they were doing such rubbish in the magazine at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, well, they were known as No Idea, and I don't know what the Women's Day one was, but um, yeah. but yeah. So so um, so you started because I think I started subscribing to those magazines back in those days when they actually did tell the news and tell you what was going on in the world. Didn't make up so much stuff. Well, we had, you know, we, there was no reason not to because we had very, um, we made a lot of money. Um, and uh, you know, to give you an idea, the first year that I was there, it went from 19 million profit to 20 over 20 million profit in a year. That's, That's amazing. That's a lot of money. But, you know, the weekly magazines, and they're selling, you know, $4 each, and you're selling hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Um, you know, we, we we had the biggest, we were able to get the best um, stories, you know, like weddings, we, you know. And we oh, did yes, of course. We did, you know, we, 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 we were very competitive with each other, um, and it was sort of like a bit of a, um, a, a you know, it was very competitive. Um, well, it was all Lady Di in those days as well, wasn't it? It was it was Lady Di, Princess Diana on every single cover of every magazine for about the ten years that she was around. Yeah, I, I wasn't editing then. I I came after Princess Diana okay. um, had had passed away. Um, but you know, back when I was there, I think the first really big cover that I did um, was you know the royals obviously were of interest, but they're. Um, you know, it was Beck and Leighton were the main, they were like our own Australian royalty and Princess Mary was like yes, Australian right. royalty. And I had, I, I actually covered her wedding in um, in Denmark. I was in the church um, and one of the few journalists allowed in the church to cover it. Um, but they were, you know. For like, what magazine was that for Women's Weekly? I did it actually for the Scotsman. She has a Scottish background newspaper called the Scotsman. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it wasn't for an Australian one at all? Yeah, I did do some work for the Australians as well, um, but that was. Um, but it was funny because when I came out of the church, um, Princess Diana's brother was there on the weekend, having a just a, a holiday there for the weekend, and I went up to him. I said, "You know, it's um, it, 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 I was thinking it's like you know the new version of Princess Diana." He didn't say that. <laughs> No, no, but and thank goodness poor old uh, Princess Mary hasn't had quite as much uh, attention, even well, though she did it, I guess, in the earlier years. So well, how, how did your career that. unfold said, she, from there? I hope oh, she has sorry. a better time than my sister. Um, and I said, yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. So so what happened next? Where, what was your next sort of step after such a huge job? So uh, well, well, I was at New Idea and, um, you know, we... We, I started campaigning and doing things. I put domestic violence on the cover, stop the violence. I um, put breast cancer on the cover and did a pink issue. I, you know, love um, you. <laughs> and 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 we, you know, and and readers are not stupid. They started buying it, and I think that actually they've got a big chance to do. You know, now that our media own um, all of the titles, they've got the opportunity to really lift up. Um, you know the quality um, of of the magazines, and uh, and I hope they do that. Um, so do I. I feel like that's the only thing left now would be for them to put really quality journalism into them with great photography, because I was thinking about like I'm a massive fan of Vanity Fair, and I've been collecting them for over a decade now. But the reason that I buy them, and, and, and they're nearly $20, is because of the great journalism and the great photography and the fact that they've got unique stories. And yet our Australian media just seems to run the same stories across almost every title, other than I would say Women's Weekly that does two or three unique interviews that nobody else seems to cover. But it's it, it's interesting, isn't it, that that they do have that opportunity now. I wonder whether they'll take it. Yeah, like and actually, you mentioned Vanity Fair. I took my inspiration from one of their covers where I saw um, that they had got these celebs to stand in, be posing in in a white t-shirt and jeans in the in the water in the sea. And so I got the entire cast of Home and Away to wear a white t-shirt, jeans, and shot did a shoot. Um, and that was for the um, Stop the Violence, um, you know, video. Um, cover that I did which was to was a white issue um right. and, and magazine and, and and new idea got magazine of the year and and I was fortunate that I was made editor of the year and new idea also got the news editor uh, news well I think you did, hang on to stop saying I was fortunate to you absolutely deserved it you were obviously doing things that people in Australia hadn't thought of in the, in in terms of the magazines yeah well you know like 
and and it just the sad thing is that it proved that those type of stories worked and yes. won accolades from it. Nicole Kidman sent us a case of Bollinger, you know, because she was so pleased. We would check stories with Wendy, who's a great mate of mine to this day, is an agent. Um, but you know, like things that that's not sort of happening anymore. And and um, to my knowledge. Um, Right. So, so what happened? So you just worked through those magazines. Was there, any, are there any more sort of insights into it before you decided to go out on your own? Well, no, or should we so start talking about voice to actually, media? There's, there's quite a bit. That, I, I left um, New Idea because I got poached to edit um, the Australian Women's Week and then I moved to ACP. And, um, right. And then um, I was there during the, um, the, the, the terrible period of um, the GFC, and, uh, but I put Magda on the cover and, those, you know, did put the, Abraham, uh, uh, the uh, Obamas on the cover and, uh, and, uh, and then I moved to Channel 7 for a year um, and then I was brought back by David Gingell to what, be... What, hang on, publisher. what were you doing at Channel 7? I was asked to run the sort of eight thirty to nine um, uh, um, section of Sunrise. Um, those the last oh, okay. hour, and I did, um, I, and and I also worked a bit on the morning show as a, an acting EP at one point. Um, and then I was, yeah, then I I got brought over um, to be publisher of the women's titles at the same company. It's like years since I left. So it was, wow, I didn't that's leave a, long. you have had really such an amazing career. Yeah. Um. And so, okay. So, so sorry, I keep interrupting you. So then, then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so then I had to start like you know we we, we started closing magazines like you know Grazia. I had to you know and, and and I just thought to myself I don't want to be that person that closes magazines. Um. And that was sort of like you could see that they were going tough times ahead. There were double-digit declines, you know, people that did, you know, and we were not able to, as much as I was trying to get the editors to be, be KPI'd for their digital, um, you know, the whole um, for the magazine as well as the, you know, the, 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 um, the 360 degree sort of coverage of their magazine um, and, and brand, um, it wasn't really happening. And so I decided to leave magazines and set my own digital site up. How did that feel, Robin? How did you well, how did you feel when you thought you were leaving this amazing career that had obviously been pretty secure to go out on your own? Were you terrified? Were you excited? I was were excited. You nervous? I, I was excited and nervous. Had a sort of healthy dose of nerves. Um, you know, I did a lot of research into it um, and what was happening overseas and what was the trend. And the carousel was your, your first one, wasn't it? And I vaguely remember you brought some pretty hard-hitting, amazing kind of editors with you from magazines that had closed down. Was that That's the, what am I did, correct yeah, I had, in my memory? I brought over the editors of Madison and Cosmo um, Extension, so Frankie Hobson and um, Lizzie Rankin, who's now got her own as dis a designer, um, uh, she was the editor of Madison, um, plus a lot of the beauty editors, um, Nadal Stelio, former editor of Clio, Pretty pretty Boss, um, Eleanor Pendleton was my beauty editor. Stephanie Amazing. Dahl. So I just, I just have to say to anyone who's watching, if you haven't discovered the carousel yet, you need to go and find it. It's the carousel dot. Com.au, is that right? Just, dot com. Yeah, the carousel. Uh, so worth it. Amazing stories. And it gives you everything that those big magazines did, but better, I would say. No, oh, thank you. Um, That's all right. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting, but a lot of those those digital sites back then, a lot of them that started up, you know, there weren't many, but there was a few of us sort of starting up. A lot of them haven't survived because advertising has been tough um, and uh, you're competing against, you know, really you're a niche site competing against the big boys, if you like, like News and the Mail and, you know, who've got literally hundreds of people working for them. I mean, the person who's done it very well and successfully is, is Mia um, Freeman from with Mama Mia, but that's an exception. Um, so I sort of pivoted um, and, uh, and uh, again, and that's when I, I launched Game Changers where I started profiling and, and charging for people to actually to build, you know, really good content for them. That they could use to market their businesses, and that was a bit um, that that probably helped save my business. Um, at the well, it time. was a good name on both levels: game changer for them, and maybe game changer for you as well, because yeah. it brought in some some good money while you were trying to sort of work out the model, I guess, of the best way to monetize the sites. Yeah, because in those days, you know, people were saying we want all our money into magazines and TV. 
and okay, we'll take a tiny bit of the budget and put it into digital. That that was sort of how it was working in those days, wasn't it? And then it did this flip to being digital. Yes. But when it did the flip, the interesting thing is that all the money went to to Facebook and Google. They swallowed it all up. It wasn't even going to Australian producers or you know people who right. were like me who are paying for Australian journalists. Um, it was going overseas. <laughs> Um, and, and that's well, been and, and again, another another model that isn't working at the moment. That that I'm sure we'll see some big changes over the next couple of years over um, over the the sort of Facebook and Google monopoly. So um, so you did game changers and women love tech. I think you said was before the carousel. Was that right? Um, no, yeah, the, the, the women love tech. I actually bought. Um, I, oh, okay, it existed. For, it's, been, it's been running for 13 years, and uh, she she. Um, you know, again, she wasn't able to monetize it, so I took it on and bought it from her as a French woman, and uh, called Frederic um, Bross, and I, I and I bought that site and completely changed it to to being much more about focusing on women in STEM, women in business, uh, and uh, and and what's popular on streaming, what's streaming, what best apps, best podcasts. Um, but um, I have actually got an um, an involvement in another site. Um, oh, called, tell me more! <laughs> it's um it's very new and it's come out of COVID, uh, and it's called Happy Alley. And um, oh, what's Happy Alley? Happy all Alley about? is a positive news site. Um, the tag is seriously positive news, um, and it's happy. God, it's just what we need. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And the great thing about Happy Alley is that it's um we have journalists all over the world. So it came about um, through a a Dutch man um, uh, and Arthur Kuman, who uh, who really felt that there's too much negative news out there, and so he is not wrong. <laughs> it's like it's like the me these days. The news just looks for the bad stories that I really even want to put out. Uh, good news stories, so we need another outlet for it. Exactly. So he 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 um uh and and then then he knew Deborah Thomas um. Uh, from a, another former editor of Women's Weekly and a friend of mine. And so she contacted me and Lindy Milan, uh, who's ex-Women's um, Weekly and a TV presenter and cookbook. Author and I was going to say cooking. She's had cooking shows over the last few years, hasn't she? Yeah, she's fabulous. And so she's involved. And one of the top journalists um, in Australia, in my view, is Michael Sheetha. Um, right. And uh, and so he's one of the writers um, as well. Um, and then Catherine Marshall, who's the former editor of Good Health, Wow, what an illustrious kind of bunch. It's a different model. We've all got shares in the company. We all, um, so the journalists, you know, like, and we have not just journalists in Australia, we've got journalists in Switzerland and France, America, various journalists I've worked with all working on it. And it's um, it's great. You know, it's very... Oh, it's a, I love the model. If, if everybody's sort of got shares in the business, that sounds fair. And also sounds like uh, it could be maybe a new model to going forward because, you know, I mean, the other thing, of course, about COVID is so many titles have closed down. They've all just given up on the print and it's all gone online, but a lot of them aren't necessarily doing the online as well as they could. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting time for the media right now, I think. Oh, it is a, a very interesting time because... You know, and my my hope is that good journalism will survive through it um, because, you know, how do you, the, the, the types of stories that I that I was fortunate enough to do when I was a young journalist, um, there is no way a media business would have the money to do the types of stories I was able to do. Like, you know, we got sent to the desert, the Sahara Desert, for three weeks. Um, to a place, and I was sent to a place called Mauritania, which was a place where they still had slaves. You know, they um, it was the last oh country in the world to abolish slavery. And at 24 years old, um, me and this woman whose husband died in a plane crash went with a group of people to try and find and, and uncover the, um, find where the, the plane had crashed so she could um, pay her respects to her husband in the oasis. Now, a story like that, it took one journalist three weeks and a photographer um, to do nothing but that story. And that's not going to happen in the future because there was, you know, no one would pay for that sort of thing now because you couldn't afford to send a journalist off for that amount of time and have a month no. on one story alone. No, it's, 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 it's a pity, but then you never know. I mean, the thing is we've got amazing journalists and we all need that reporting we need that impartial thing especially with all this fake news and everything that goes through your Facebook feed and and Google that's just kind of fed to you as opposed to being objective I guess 
So yeah, um, and I think that's why, you know, like a Happy Mail Alley is a subscription model. And I think that's why people have to be aware that, you know, if you want to read good journalism, then maybe you have to pay for it. Um, and oh, yeah. And, I, and I'd say that most people would be happy to, especially mm. if they know it's going to go into the pocket of the journalist yeah, exactly. and not the big machine that's employing the journalist. So exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I hope that's going to continue. So in terms of running your own business, have there been any challenges along the way that you've learned a lot from that you would maybe share? with us well yeah because um i mean after doing the media business i also um went very heavily into the tech um, world and i was asked to be on a board of an asx listed company and i ended up um doing a uh, a management buyout and we built the app for vivid um the year before last is this um, for vivid the vivid festival mm, yes it all right vivid. And it was using augmented reality. I think this is the way media is going to go, actually, immersive media. So using augmented reality um, where um, and gamifying, we gamified um, the, the, um, the app so that you were rewarded by getting involved in more things. So if you went from, uh, the, from say, Circular Key to Taronga Zoo to um, the Darling Harbour, you got points and the more, if you got all the points for each destination you could go to with Vivid, you then were in to win a prize. So it was what we call gamification. And, ah, uh, interesting. Yeah. So I then, um, you know, what, one of the other things it did is you went to um, the, the King's Cross um, fountain and you could hold up your phone and you would see the TAFE students' art come up on your phone in augmented reality. So it's quite wow, exciting. Wow, isn't that amazing? It was, and, um, and and so from that, I then ended up um, building a, a a retail app called Sweep, which also did the same sort of thing. Like it was like a shopping treasure hunt, um, where you could and and Afterpay backed me on doing a treasure hunt with them. Um, but we, the idea was that every time you bought something at uh, with after, at Afterpay stores, you unlocked so, uh, um, content. And in this case, it was a puppy dog cute puppy Aww. dog mm. <laughs> and um, puppies work for everyone they did it was fantastic it was you know but it, again a bit ahead of its time it just happened before COVID and when COVID happened having put a lot of money and time and effort and having um, even being awarded as a shopping innovation of the year by finders one of the finalists um we had to close it down and that happened this year at the beginning of this year. Oh, so, how hard was that to make that decision? Because you never know whether you're just about to, you know, take off. I had Chinese off. investors ready to invest, you know, saying they wanted to invest millions into it. And, uh, and I, you know, like I can see that it's, more, you know, that with the phones and the technology we've got now, it's definitely going to be the way it's going, you know, um, where you will unlock rewards on your phone. You can expect that in the future. Um, oh, well, uh, that'd be. But so for you, do you have regrets for closing it down? Will you open it up again when, you know, God forbid, all these all these lockdowns and things end? Or is that kind of the experiment was done, didn't work at the time, move on? I have moved on. Um, I, have, <laughs> I have moved on and I don't want to put more good money into it at the moment. Um, yeah, fair enough. So what happened was, you know, like I, I do think that I that the knowledge that I've got in immersive media won't go away and I'd like to do something that's new and fresh in that area. Um, so, you know, but it was a big learning for me because I, you know, I thought I'm going to back myself and, and it, not all things work out because... You know, you have to have timing and you have to have quite a lot of luck and the timing with COVID was not good for retail. No, and nothing that you would have been able to predict either. Nothing. Well, Robin, what can I say? I could talk to you for hours. God, I'd love to talk to you for hours about all that gossip about stars. That's my favourite topic. <laughs> this is a but in the meantime, you go down sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> but um, it's just been an absolute pleasure interviewing oh, you. Thank you, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. Um, no, it, it's been great. Um, now, for anybody who's been, oh, for anyone who's watching first, where can they get hold of you? Where can they see? The Carousel Women Love Tech Game Changers. Can you just give us a quick rundown? Yeah. So, so, so first of all, um, also look at improfile.com.au, which is um, uh, um, part of my, um, you know, profiling people in business. Um, oh, uh, I do have to look at that. Yeah, and then I have. Um, it's um, you can contact me at robin at thecarousel.com. Um, yep. And uh, and I'm, I'd love to hear from you. 
Okay. Thank you so much. Now, if you've enjoyed this, please, will you make a comment, like, and even subscribe to the channel? Uh, we also have an amazing podcast where we've interviewed tens, if well, over 80 women so far. Um, and they're, and each one is an hour with a female founder and I take them through their life story as well. And I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Um, we also have a membership program. We have online lunches that we run and all sorts of things. And you can find it all at she's the boss.com.au. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode and come back to watch more.